Well, I'd like to begin by telling you two stories, true stories. And after each of these stories, I want you to ask yourself a question. The question is this. Is this story best explained by saying it was a coincidence or could it be a miracle? So the first story took place several years ago in a little village in Africa right along the equator. It was a place with no electricity, no hospitals, no pharmacies, um, no incubators for newborns, uh, very few medical supplies. And a woman uh, died during childbirth. And she left behind a little two-year-old girl and this newborn, prematurely born little boy. And they knew that the life of this fragile, prematurely born child was at risk. Because people don't generally think about it on the equator, but it gets really cold there at night. And they knew they needed to keep this fragile child warm during the cold evening. So they took a hot water bottle and filled it with hot water. But as the helper was doing that, it burst and destroyed the hot water bottle, and it was the last one in the village. And they knew without that hot water bottle, chances are that little fragile child would not live through the night. Well, there was a missionary doctor in the village from Northern Ireland. Her name is Dr. Helen Rosevere. And she gathered together all of the orphans and said, let's pray for this little newborn boy. And so the orphans began to pray. But one little 10-year-old girl by the name of Ruth seemed to go too far. She prayed this. She said, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, because the baby will be dead. So please, send it this afternoon. And then as if that weren't audacious enough, then she added this. And she said, oh, and God, while you're at it, would you please send a dolly for the little girl so she'll know that you really love her? The missionary doctor said later, I was put on the spot. Could I honestly say amen? I just did not believe that God could do this. Oh, yeah, I know he can do everything. The Bible said so, but there are limits, aren't there? I mean, the only hope of them getting this hot water bottle that this child needed to survive would be as if it, if it were to arrive in a package sent from home. And in the four years that that doctor worked in that village, not one package had ever arrived from home, not one. Besides, if someone's packing a package, a care package for people on the equator, the last thing you think you're going to include would be a hot water bottle, right? Well, a couple of hours later, a jeep pulled up and dropped off a 22-pound package. And the orphans pounced on it, and they're sorting through the content. There was some clothes for them. There were some bandages for the leprosy patients. There was some food and so. And the missionary said this, As I put my hand in again, I felt the, could it really be? I grasped it and pulled it out. Yes, a brand-new rubber hot water bottle. And she burst into tears. She said later, I had not asked God to send it. I had not truly believed that he could. And with that, little Ruth rushed forward and said, well, if God sent the bottle, he must have sent the dolly too. And so she dug through the package, and sure enough, at the bottom of the package, she found it, a beautifully wrapped little doll. And Ruth said, can I go over with you, mummy, and give this dolly to that little girl? so that you'll know that Jesus really loves her. Well, friends, that parcel was packed by the missionary's former Sunday school class in Northern Ireland five months earlier. The leader felt led by God to include a hot water bottle, and a little girl contributed the doll. And this package, again, the only one ever to arrive, happened to be delivered the very same day that little Ruth prayed for it with the faith of a child. So here's the question. Was that just a curious coincidence, or is it a miraculous answer to a little girl's prayers? Second story involves a brilliant young African-American student from the inner city of Detroit, Michigan, who earned a full scholarship to study medicine at Yale University. But he was having trouble. It was the end of his first semester, 
and he was failing his chemistry class. And chemistry class was a prerequisite. If you wanted to be a doctor, you had to pass chemistry. And he was just, he was not doing well in this class. Everything depended on the final exam. That would determine if he passed the class or failed. And he wasn't prepared. And so he prayed. And he said, God, medicine is the only thing I ever wanted to do. Would you please tell me what it is that you really want me to do? So he was planning just to study all night, to cram for this exam so he would pass it. But he fell asleep. And it all seemed lost. Until he had a dream. And in that dream, he was alone in the auditorium when a nebulous figure began to write chemistry problems and answers on the blackboard in chalk. And so the next day, when the student went to take his exam, he was stunned because the first problem on the exam was the exact problem from his dream. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And he ended up acing the exam And he got a good grade in chemistry, and he promised God, you will never have to do that for me again. Well, he became an extraordinary physician. By age 33, he became the youngest director of pediatric neurosurgery in the country, doing um, pioneering brain surgery on little children. He served at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and maybe you've heard his name. It's Ben Carson later became one of the 10 most admired people in the United States, ran for president, now he's a member of the president's cabinet. So what do you think? Was that a coincidence or was it a miracle? Well, as you may know, I was an atheist for much of my life, but ultimately it was the historical evidence for the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus, what we're going to observe this Easter next week. It was the historical data about the resurrection of Jesus that convinced me that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And so I came to faith in Christ because of the strength of the evidence. But you know what? My skeptical nature did not disappear at my conversion. I mean, yeah, I believe God had done miracles in the past. I I believe that. The Gospels report these miracles of Jesus in a very sober way. They're not once upon a time. They're in a historical context. And even his opponents didn't dispute the fact that Jesus did miracles. They merely criticized him because he would do them sometimes on the Sabbath. But I wondered, is God still in the miracle business today? I mean, is God still divinely intervening in lives in the 21st century? I didn't really know. I wasn't sure. And so I decided to use my journalism training and my legal training to systematically investigate the realm of the supernatural. And I ended up spending two years on this project. And the result is my new book, which is called The Case for Miracles. I travel the country to interview scholars, to do research, and I interview people on all sides of this issue. In fact, the first three chapters of my book is an interview with the most famous skeptic in America, uh, Dr. Michael Shermer, founder and editor of Skeptic Magazine. Um, So I have all sides in the book, but I'm telling you what, the results of my investigation absolutely blew me away. Here are my conclusions. Number one, God is still in the miracle business. Number two, miracles occur a lot more often than people think. And number three, a lot of miracles are far better documented than than skeptics suppose. In fact, you're going to hear in this message uh, from a woman whose miracle is probably the most uh, well-documented miracle I ever came across. I want to look at four big questions about miracles. The first one is this. How should we define a miracle? What is a miracle? You know, people throw around the word miracle very loosely these days. You know, you're, you're in downtown Houston, traffic, it's rush hour, traffic's a mess. But, oh, look, a parking space right where you needed to go to this one building. You say, it's a miracle. It's a, and you know what? In Houston, it may be a miracle. You know? <laughs> uh, 
But, you know, we throw that word around, and often there is a natural explanation behind it. There are natural causes behind these coincidences that sometimes we'll just call a miracle. And after all, God set up the world. God set up these natural processes, and so you would expect that most of the time God would work through the natural processes that he himself created. So what is a miracle then? Well, lots of philosophers have suggested definitions, but I think the best definition comes from the late philosophy professor Richard Pertill. He gave a five-point definition, and it goes like this. A miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God has acted in history. I think that's a pretty good comprehensive definition of a miracle. Now, for me, when I see something that's absolutely extraordinary, that has spiritual overtones, that is well-documented, that is not explainable by natural means, and is validated by an independent source or event or reliable eyewitnesses, that's when the miracle bell goes off in my mind. In other words, a dream about a nebulous figure writing chemistry problems on a blackboard, in and of itself, that is not a miracle. But if those equations and answers turn out to be the very same ones that present themselves the next day on a test independently prepared by someone else, that does seem miraculous, especially when the incident follows a fervent prayer to God for help. Question number two, aren't miracles impossible because they violate the laws of nature? You hear this a lot from skeptics. In fact, the most famous skeptic of history is David Hume, a Scottish philosopher from the 1700s. And he said miracles are a violation of the laws of nature, so they're not possible. But he just misunderstood what a miracle is. Miracles are not a violation of the laws of nature. If I had an apple and I dropped the apple, the law of gravity says uh, uh, the apple would fall to the ground, that it would be pulled to the ground by gravity. But if I take an apple and I drop it and you reach in and grab it before it hits the ground, you're not violating the law of uh, of gravity. You're merely intervening. So when God performs a miracle, he's not overturning or invalidating or violating the laws of nature that he himself created. He's merely intervening in his creation. In my book, I spend two chapters, and I've talked on this topic here before, but I have an interview with a Ph.D. from UCLA, uh, a physicist. And and I spent two chapters building the scientific evidence that points toward a supernatural creator of the universe. The Genesis 1 verse 1 is accurate when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that cosmology and physics back up that claim. And if God is the creator, then of course he can intervene in the world. Timothy Keller put it this way. If a God exists who is big enough to create the universe in all its complexity and vastness, why should a mere miracle be such a mental stretch? In other words, if God can cause a universe to leap into existence, then a virgin birth or walking on water, that's just child's play. Question number three, how common are miracles today? How common are they really? Well, as part of my research, I hired a highly respected public opinion polling service to do a scientific sampling of Americans and ask them about their opinions and experiences with the miraculous. And what I found really surprised me. For instance, I found that nearly two out of every five Americans said they have had at least one experience in their life that can only be explained as being a miracle. 38%. Let let me ask you, how many of you have had an experience in your life that you could only explain as being a miracle? Yeah, a lot more than 38%. Yep. Now, let's extrapolate from that number. If 38% of American adults say that they have had at least one miracle in their life, this would mean that we would have a minimum of 94,792,000 miracles just in the United States. 
Now, let's pick an arbitrary number, and let's say, well, let's say 99% of those cases, they weren't really miracles. They were just really extraordinary coincidences. So let's rule out 99% of those cases. We would still have a million miracles that have taken place just here in the United States. That's a lot more than I anticipated. Now, I interviewed, as I said, Dr. Michael Shermer, editor of Skeptic Magazine for my book, and uh, Skeptic Magazine had an article that claimed that it's only the, in their words, uneducated and uncivilized who believe in miracles. And yet, get this, this is maybe the most amazing statistic of all. 55% of physicians in the United States say they have seen an incident in their practice of medicine that they can only explain as being a miracle. 55% of doctors have seen a miracle in their practice. Now, you can't write off doctors as being uneducated and quote-unquote uncivilized. They understand how the human body works. They understand the process of healing and how it usually takes place. They are well-educated, and yet a majority of them say, I've seen it in my own practice. Friends, I think miracles occur a lot more often than we might suppose. I mean, could it be that we just need to open our eyes a little wider to the supernatural activity of God right in our midst. Now, let me mention this. My opinion is, and I think the research bears this out, the number of miracles around planet Earth are not evenly distributed. There are clusters of miracles that take place. And they generally tend to proliferate in areas where the gospel is just breaking into a new area. In Mozambique, in China, you see a, an outbreak, a cluster of miracles taking place. In fact, one expert told me that up to 90% of the growth of the church in China is because of people either themselves or they know someone who's experienced a supernatural healing in their life. In fact, in Ethiopia, where again, the gospel is breaking in, more than 80% in the Lutheran church attribute their conversions to divine healings. So we see this around the world, outbreaks, spates of miracles breaking out, where the gospel is breaking in, and God is showing his power and pointing people toward him and toward the truth of the gospel. Question number four. How can we know that a miracle is genuine? How do we know it's real? I mean, after all, many times what we loosely call a miracle really has natural explanations behind it. For instance, it could be the placebo effect. The placebo effect is when people think they're going to get better, and it's kind of a mind over matter thing. They think they're going to get better, and so they tend to feel better. It's kind of a mental, psychological phenomenon. Or it could be a mistaken diagnosis. Or it could be fakery or fraud. There are a lot of charlatans out there. Could be faulty memories. Could be spontaneous remission. Some diseases are known to go into spontaneous remission. Now, generally, it's over a period of time, and often the disease will come back. But sometimes that happens. And all of that is true, but as I discovered in my investigation, those naturalistic explanations cannot account for all of the miracle claims. There are other healings and miraculous events that are simply inexplicable apart from the supernatural work of God. So how can we tell if a miracle has occurred? Well, some skeptics, when you get into the topic of miracles, they ratchet up their skepticism unreasonably high. They just set the bar of belief unreasonably high. I'll give you an example. There was an atheist, a woman physician, who wrote an article for Skeptic Magazine. And she said, what would it take for me to believe a miracle had taken place? Well, she said, if a chicken learned how to read and then beat a grandmaster at chess, then I might start to think, okay, something's going on here. She wouldn't say a miracle, it was something unusual, something maybe supernatural. Well, I think that's setting the bar unreasonably high. Here's my view. I believe we can reasonably conclude that a miracle occurred if we have solid documentation 
and multiple and credible eyewitnesses who have no motive to deceive, if there's no alternative natural explanation, and if there's spiritual overtones, for instance, prayer. In fact, science can be used sometimes to point us toward whether or not actual miracles are taking place. I think science is the friend of miracles. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, for my book, I uh, interviewed a woman, PhD from Harvard, who is a professor at a well-respected secular university, Indiana University. She heard about this outbreak of miracles in Mozambique. And so she decided, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to research it. I'm going to use science to try to determine, is something supernatural taking place? So what did she do? She took a team of researchers and scientists to Mozambique. And they would go into these remote villages, and they would ask, anybody who is blind or deaf, bring them to us. Or anybody with severe vision or hearing problems, bring them to us. And they would test them scientifically. What is their level of hearing? What is their level of vision? Immediately thereafter, so they test them one minute. The next minute, they're turned over to Christians who have a track record of God using them in miracles. Turned over to Christians to be prayed for. And they, these Christians would lay hands on them, and they would pray for them for 10 minutes up to an hour each. And then, immediately after that, they're scientifically tested again. What is their level of hearing now? What is their level of vision now? And guess what they discovered? Virtually every single one of them improved to one degree or another, often astoundingly so. For instance, there was a woman by the name of Martine. When they tested Martine scientifically, they found that she was incapable of hearing a jackhammer next to her. That's how deaf she was. After 10 minutes of prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, they tested her again. She could hear a normal conversation. Absolutely amazing. How do you account for that? And then they said, this is so extraordinary, we need to try to replicate this experiment somewhere else. So they went to Brazil in another place where miracles are breaking out. They did the same thing. Guess what? They got the same results. Now, this was a rigorous scientific study that was accepted for publication in a major secular peer-reviewed medical journal. And I interviewed this, the woman in charge, PhD from Harvard, Dr. Candy Gunther Brown. Here's what she told me. She said, Lee, our study shows that something is going on. She said, this is more than just wishful thinking. It's not fakery. It's not fraud. It's not some televangelist trying to get widows to send in their money. It's not a highly charged atmosphere that plays on people's emotions. Something, she said, is going on. And she's right. I think it's something supernatural. Now, my book talks about lots of, of, of the documented miracles that have taken place, but the one that I investigated that absolutely blew me away the most was a woman by the name of Barbara Snyder. I interviewed Barbara at length. We have extensive medical records from her uh, dating back many years from the Mayo Clinic and, and her other physicians. We have multiple credible eyewitnesses with no motive to deceive. We have two of her doctors who were so blown away by what happened to her, they wrote about it in books. Because they said, I've got to write about it. This is unbelievable. So let me tell you what happened to Barbara. Barbara was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the Mayo Clinic. For the next several years, she just deteriorated. Got worse and worse. She had repeated hospitalizations, repeated surgeries, until ultimately she was dying. And they put her in hospice at her home. So she's confined to bed at her home. One of her physicians, Dr. Harold P. Adolph, a board-certified surgeon who had performed 25,000 operations in his career, he called Barbara, quote, one of the most hopelessly ill patients I ever saw. Hopelessly ill. One of her lungs was non-functional. The other was just inflated at 50%. A tube was inserted into her neck, and oxygen was pumped from canisters in her garage so she could breathe. She'd lost control of her urination and her bowels. 
She was legally blind. All she could see were, were sh uh, gray shadows. Uh, a feeding tube was inserted into her stomach. She hadn't walked in like seven years, and so her legs had atrophied. Her muscles had, 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 had shrunken, and, and her legs atrophied. And, and she was curled up like a pretzel in her bed from her illness. Her hands were flexed so that her fingers were touching her wrists, and her feet were permanently flexed and extended. Her parents met with doctors, and they agreed there's nothing more medically that could be done. And they said the next time she contracts pneumonia, which because of her lung situation, she would contract it on a regular basis, they would not try to revive her because it would just prolong her inevitable death. Well, then one day, someone, a friend, called WMBI, which is the radio station in Chicago that's run by the Moody Bible Institute, a Christian radio station. And they said, would you announce and just ask people to pray for Barbara. Barbara's on her deathbed. Um, she's really suffering. Um, would you please have people pray? And we know that a minimum of 450 Christians began to pray for Barbara. How do we know? Because they sent letters telling Barbara, we're praying for you. So what happened? I'm going to let Barbara... Uh, describe to you what happened next, to tell you herself what happened on Pentecost Sunday with her friends who came to her to read her some of these encouraging letters that the people who were praying for her had written to her. So let's watch, Barbara. June 7th, 1981. I'll never forget it. It was a day like any other day for me. That was one spent confined to bed, unable to breathe on my own, hooked up to machines, a tracheostomy tube in my neck, my arms curled up, my legs curled up. I lay there trapped inside my own body is really how it felt. I had two friends over. They came over all the time. They were from my church. My church family never forgot me. Mm. So while they were there, I still remember exactly what they were reading when all of a sudden um, I heard a booming, authoritative, loud voice over my shoulder over here say, my child, get up and walk. And there was nobody else in the room. And there was no one else in the room, and the door was over here. There were windows over this way. And instantly, I knew it was God. But instantly, I also knew that my friends didn't hear that, hmm. which is kind of interesting, too. Yeah. Um, and I needed to share with them what I heard. Well, I had this tracheostomy tube in my neck. That's how I breathed. And I had hands that did not work. So my friends said whenever I looked agitated, they knew I wanted to talk. So they'd come and plug the hole in my neck. And I said, I don't know what you're going to think about this, but God just told me to get up and walk. And my friends got really quiet. <laughs> I know, but he really did tell me to get up and walk. Run, get my family. I want them to be here. And um, my friends all of a sudden jumped up. And while they jumped, so did I. I was so excited, I couldn't wait for anyone. <laughs> And I literally jumped out of the bed. This, this is where you'd almost have to have known me to see how totally impossible that was. So this time, I remember reaching up and pulling my oxygen off my neck. I remember that. And then I jumped toward the voice. My friends are over here, but I jumped towards the voice. And as I jumped up, the first thing I remember isn't what I would think I would remember. But I jumped out of the bed, and I looked, and I saw my feet. They were flat on the ground just like everyone else's, which sounds normal, but not for me. I had foot drops so badly I couldn't even wear slippers on my feet. They were so curled. So when I jumped up to have feet flat, I was amazed and stood staring at my feet. And when I did that, I jumped like this, and then I saw my hands. And they were open, and they never opened. And so now they were open, and I stood staring at them, and then it dawned on me I could see me. That's what I would have thought I would have noticed mm. first was my vision but I didn't. It I was noticed, back. You could see. It was back. I was perfectly fine. And I stood staring again for a little while, just feeling what it felt like to look at and see me. And then I turned. And that's when we were like women. We all started jumping up and down, screaming and thanking the Lord. I remember I didn't understand anything except for once I was real sick, I was well again. And it has to be God. That's all I knew. <laughs> Thank you.
Barbara was instantly and thoroughly healed. Her eyesight was immediately restored. Her lungs immediately went back to normal. Her mother came running into the room and fell to her knees and began to feel her calves. She said, your muscles are back. Her muscle tone had returned instantly to her legs so she could walk after seven years. Um, her father came in and, and, and hugged her and then began waltzing with her around the room. Well, this was a Sunday that this happened, and there was a church service that night at her church, which was Wheaton Wesleyan Church in suburban Chicago. They were holding a service, and so at the point in the service, a pastor gets up and says, now, does anybody have any announcements they want to mention? And with that, Barbara began to stroll down the aisle in front of everybody who had only known her for all these years as being curled up in a wheelchair or sick in bed. She comes strolling down the aisle, and the place erupts, and people begin singing, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, and now I see. The next morning, she went to one of her doctors, Dr. Thomas Marshall, an internist for 30 years. And when he saw her walking toward him down the corridor, he said later, my first reaction was, oh, she died, and this is a ghost. <laughs> That's the only way he could account for it. His response was this, quote, this is medically impossible. Friends, God instantly and completely and astoundingly healed Barbara in one miraculous moment. This is, there's no natural explanation for this. This was not some sort of um, spontaneous remission, which happens over a period of time, and the illness often comes back. This was instantaneous, her eyesight returning, her lungs reinflating, her entire body immediately healed. And how would you explain that voice telling her to get up and walk? This would be like a voice telling you, get up and fly. And you'd say, well, I can't do that. That's how wild it was for her. Say, get up and walk after all these years. And yet she heard that. How do you explain that? Well, the illness has never come back today. This happened more than 30 years ago. Today, Barbara is married uh, to a pastor, and they have a little church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And one of her doctors wrote this, quote, I have never witnessed anything like this before or since, and considered it a rare privilege to observe the hand of God performing a true miracle. Friends, this is just one of several cases I document in my book, The Case for Miracles. I mean, I have credible accounts of dead coming back to life, of people being healed instantaneously of deafness and burns and broken ankles and meningitis and so after prayers to Jesus. Here's the point. God is still in the miracle business today. Now, I think these miracles, yeah. I think these miracles tell us three things about God. Number one, he's real. These miracles point people toward the reality that God exists. In fact, Jesus said in John 4, verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Well, people believe when they see this kind of miracle take place. And it points them toward the reality of God. Number two, it shows that God is powerful. He can do anything. And sometimes we think, he can't deal with my situation. He can't deal with my hopelessness. And God is powerful. He can do anything he desires to do. And then third, God is loving. God is loving. A miracle like the one to Barbara is just such a beautiful expression of the love and grace of God in her life. Now, what about people who pray for healing that doesn't come in this life? Right? I asked Barbara at the end. She's such a sweetheart. At the end, I said, can I just give you a hug? And, and, and I gave her a hug, and I said, Barbara, let me ask you one other thing. Why you? Why you? You know, my wife, Leslie, has a chronic illness She's in pain every single day for the last 20 years. She's not been healed. God's not done a miracle in her life. Why you? And she looked at me and she said, Lee, I don't know. I don't know. But we know that God is sovereign, that God will do as he will do. We know that God's ways are above our ways. He understands things and sees things that we don't that he sees good that can emerge, that we don't see it in the midst, and we know that God will ultimately heal all of his children as he takes us into eternity with him. 
We also know, and this is interesting, miracles were not automatic in Jesus' day either. You know, Matthew says that Jesus didn't do many miracles in Nazareth. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, the disciples are given the authority to heal, and yet, seven chapters later, they fail when they try to heal an epileptic boy. Paul didn't heal everyone. He left Trophimus behind while he was still sick. And in fact, Paul himself was never healed of this thorn in the flesh that he talks about, some affliction that he had that apparently God never chose to take away. Well, I'm going to do a message in the future on this topic. What about miracles that don't happen? We don't have time to go into it much today, but we will. And and the chapter in my book, I knew I could not write a book about miracles without addressing this. And I went to a guy who is a brilliant philosopher, Ph.D., professor at a major seminary, written major books about the evidence for God, and his wife is dying prematurely of a brain disease that is robbing her of her ability to reason. She no longer understands what a hairbrush is. She no longer understands what a telephone does. And she's, she's young. She's just in her 50s. And they have prayed fervently for healing, and it's not yet come. And I interviewed him, and he is able to talk as a philosopher, as an expert, as a theologian, and bring context, but also with the heart of someone who is watching this unfold in his very life. And that chapter, I wept as I wrote that chapter. It is the single most profound interview I've ever had in my life. The wisdom that God has given him because of this circumstance is so deep and so rich and so relevant that for me as a husband to a wife who suffers, and maybe to you, um, I just think that chapter is going to be so powerful. So we'll do a message on that at some point. Not, tonight's not the time, but in the meantime, I believe that interview, God's going to use it to heal a lot of hearts. That's our God. That is our God. He is still in the miracle business today. Let's talk to him. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe of what you do. I mean, I talk to Barbara. I look at the records. I see the witnesses. And I cannot deny that you are still in the miracle business. I listen to this tape from Dwayne, and I see evidence that you're still intervening divinely in people's lives. We thank you for that. We thank you you're not some distant and disinterested God, but you are ever-present. You offer a relationship with us that will go forever in eternity. So we celebrate that right now. We thank you for the fact that you love us so much that there are those times when you reach in and you sovereignly heal or you do something else that just opens our eyes once more to how great you are, how loving you are, and how real you are. We thank you for all of this. And all God's people said, amen.